Welcome to the Sarah Andreco Show. So welcome, Dr. Cutler. I'm really happy to be having this conversation with you in particular because, as I'm sure you're probably tired of hearing the term pandemic puppies, but realistically speaking, we've got a lot of veterinary professionals, trainers, and behaviorists out there that are going to need some good support through these times to help their clients through these times. So I think having an applied animal behaviorist on, this is perfect timing. I'm hoping you can help us all kind of navigate these waters um, and helping people overcome some of the issues that we're seeing with pandemic puppies, but then also set up veterinary professionals for moving forward, how to avoid some of the issues that we're currently seeing with this population and puppies. So thanks for, so much for joining me today to talk about this. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to chat about it. Yeah, I think this is going to be fun. We're going to get into some some good details. So one of the things that I, I definitely want to start off right away is looking at things from a veterinary hospital perspective. So in the vet world, everyone is so good about talking with owners about those four rounds of vaccines and the deworming and when to come in for annual exams and what they're going to need from a health perspective. But what I still see lacking in private practice is that behavior side of things. I almost feel like Maybe some practices are intimidated about talking about behavioral foundations. You know, the, the, the kind of go-to default is just to pop in a trainer's card and the puppy pack and kind of send them on their way. So I kind of wanted to dissect that a little bit and maybe talk a bit about how veterinary practitioners and supporting staff can start weaving in behavior more and being more comfortable with that, given that it's so very important at that stage when they're first seeing those puppies to setting them up for success for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And I mean, I can understand when there's so many other things to be covering too, that behavior does, unless there's concerns about it, it does kind of get put aside and doesn't get chatted about. Um, but it's definitely really important to talk about during those early visits because we're really setting the behavioral foundation for these puppies. Um, in particular, socialization is kind of the big one that I wish a lot of veterinarians and veterinary staff would be talking to new pet owners about, um, and even more so right now, as it's quite difficult to accomplish, but just giving some kind of information about that would be very helpful. Yeah, and I, I um, just in some of the practices that I've worked for, one of the things that I always just try to instill because it's an easy go-to and easy grab is the puppy socialization statement that talks about safe socialization. So making sure that puppies are very safely around vaccinated animals and low areas of population, anyhow, getting out there and getting around other um, dogs, cats, birds, farm animals, and things like that. So I know that that's one thing that they can just kind of pop to them. But what do you think about some of these um, courses that are out there? Like I know Dr. Foote offers one where um, you can kind of take this puppy certification course, and that way you can have someone in-house at the hospital working with clients specifically on the behavior side of things versus just the vaccines, like separate from that. So they can kind of give them the overview of what to look for and what to expect. Yeah, I don't know the content of that course in particular, but I mean, I think if veterinarians can send their support staff to some sort of course or do an online one um, that gives them further information that can do nothing but benefit, I think, the general population and give them more information um, and also build the confidence of the staff in talking about that. Um, there, I think there are quite a few different ones out there and a lot of the different certifications like Fear Free do touch a little bit, I think, on those as well. So there is different avenues to get that information. Um, so I think just really making an effort to, to do that can really be beneficial for the clinic itself. Do you have some favorites? Um, I don't have any that I send people to and I really should look some up so that I can do that. Um I, I did know about Sally Foots, but I, I really don't know about the ones that are available in terms of especially covering puppy stuff. I think um, there tends to be a bit more information about behavior problems than actually the prevention of it, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Just in, in kind of doing some research to see what was available out there, I, I find the same thing. I'm not finding a lot that's uh, solidly put together. So this could be a, an opportunity for people out there right now, actually. <laughs> but yeah, as yes. far as prevention and laying kind of that those foundational skills and behaviors, you're right. 
I feel like a lot of things address, you know, what are some of the problems that we're seeing instead of how to prevent those problems to begin with. Yeah, that can be tough. Um, so in, in discussing some of the problems too, I, I think what would be good to just, just for, uh, from a, from a, an aid perspective is walking through some of the, the critical and social periods so that some veterinary staff listening in can at least get kind of an overview of what that looks like, what those critical periods and those social periods, those fear periods look like. Um, but also just touching on some of those problem behaviors, because if, if we are looking at some of the things that um, we can catch early on during these initial puppy visits, you know, sometimes we can stop those in their tracks and help readjust and help the client um, overcome those problems before it becomes a really big problem, you know, snowballing. And, and since veterinary staff is kind of the first line of defense when it comes to seeing some of these, what are some things that you would say, um, especially during some of those first phases or things that they should look out for and maybe direct them to a behavior professional or a trainer to, to tackle head on to start with? Yeah. So um, I guess the first part of that, the socialization period. So that runs from about three to 12 to 14 weeks of age. Um the science on that was done quite a while ago, and it's a little bit difficult to do because in order to really figure out that time frame, you have to have puppies that are completely unsocialized, which ethically can be a concern. Yeah. Um, so it's somewhere around that range. There's some research that's saying it might be even slightly longer than that, but it's really a short period of time where puppies are more open to new social interactions and learning about new social interactions. So we really want to put a lot of effort into appropriate socialization during that time. Um, unfortunately, during that same period of time, there's the fear period that you mentioned. So one of the fear periods is from about eight to 10 weeks of age, somewhere in there. Um, and during that time, puppies may become more fearful of things that they weren't or more reluctant to approach new things, that sort of stuff. Um, but part of the problem with the fear period is that if they have a single event that is very um, fear inducing, it can have consequences for the rest of their lives. So it's called single event learning and something that happens during that time. And that kind of coincides with a lot of veterinary visits as well can cause fear later on. So it's something we really want to be careful of and something we can discuss as well. Um, to answer your question about things to look at, um, there's so many different things that you could be looking out for. Um, we, I've talked a little bit about fear. So fear in puppies is definitely one of the main things that um, clients may be noticing. So a little bit of caution around new things is pretty normal for a puppy. Um, but a puppy that will never approach new things or has to be encouraged for an extended period of time might be a little bit concerning and something that vets may want to flag and talk to owners about um, and perhaps send them on to a trainer or a behavior consultant in order to get some help from that. Um, I, I kind of see fear as one of the bigger ones. I don't know if you do as well in the dogs that you see, but it's kind of one of the early indicators that we can see there might be something going on with this puppy. Yeah, I agree. Fear is definitely one of the big ones that I see. Some of the other ones are pretty minimal and just kind of sporadic here and there. Um, and, and then begs the question, now that you have this puppy that's showing early signs of fear, you know, what do you do to kind of combat that at that at that level at that stage? We have to be careful about now kind of, you know, pushing them over the edge or, you know, getting into any type of flooding or anything like that. So, you know, what's your advice for people when when they're starting to see some of these things? I mean, should they just go ahead and loop a trainer in or a behavior professional? Or would you say that the veterinary staff in particular could give them some advice or work through some things initially to help bring that puppy kind of more out and really encourage curiosity, you know, give them some, some different enrichment activities to try to help pull them out of that shell somewhat. Yeah. And I think maybe even a combination of the two might be useful for some puppies. It's really dependent a bit on the dog owner's ability to work on things too. So a veterinarian or veterinary staff can definitely give a lot of advice. And if a client can go home and really try to implement that on their own, then they may not need the help of a trainer. But if they are the kind of person that really likes to be walked through a procedure of some sort, then getting a trainer involved may be more beneficial. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, the lack of flooding and really talking to clients about how to socialize puppies appropriately is important. So um, you don't just want to be throwing a puppy into a new environment or into an area where there's a whole bunch of new people or new uh, dogs because it's likely to become fearful for them or they're likely to experience fear. So you want it to be a positive experience. And that's kind of the most important part about socialization is that it they're having the time to see new things, experience new things in a positive manner. So really talking to people about doing that gradually so that you're not causing fear and that you're making it a positive experience is definitely important. Yeah, one of the things that I'll often tell clients too when I, I see some some um, uh, you know the kind of a, a dip in the fear direction with their newer puppies is to kind of observe from a distance. So perhaps you go to a public yeah. park or a public area and you're not all up in the kids playing in the playground <laughs> and everything else, but you're back on a picnic blanket. You know, you've got a squeaky toy and you're you're doing a couple of little skill building sessions with them, just having some fun and not having to be directly interacting, and then per- potentially just kind of slowly, gradually moving closer and closer to those things over time to where that becomes a little bit more comfortable for them. So not always necessarily being right up in things during socialization. How do you feel about that? I completely agree. So the, I think the theory used to be that you just tried to get your puppy exposed to everything and just bring them everywhere, do everything with them, have every person you meet interact with your puppy. And the pandemic, I think, in some ways is actually beneficial in that respect because we aren't approaching everyone and we aren't teaching our puppies that they need to go be involved in everything that's going on. And people are stepping back a little bit because they're trying to social distance. So I think we're going to end up with puppies that maybe don't feel like they need to jump on every person they see. If they're an excited, happy dog that is, you know, used to seeing new people and new dogs, they may not have that need to interact. Where I see a lot of dogs pre-pandemic that had been socialized in that kind of old methodology of socialization, they wanted to, um, they were really excited. They would get overly aroused whenever they saw people or other dogs because they wanted to go see them. And I'd have owners complaining that they had to go visit every other person when they were walking and they couldn't walk back by anyone without their dog barking and getting excited. So I'm, I think that we may see this difference in our pandemic puppies where they've been taught that they can experience things but not necessarily interact with it all. And that, you know, in the long run, it may be beneficial on that side of things. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, <clears throat> I can't tell you how many owners that, I, that I've worked with that are like, my dog just won't listen to me. He's perfect in the home, does everything I ask, you know, follows every cue. And then we get in this outside environment and he just has to go see everybody. And he's at the end of the leash and he's barking and carrying on. I'm like, well, when he was little, did you go let him meet every single person that you came into contact with instead of learning how to interact with you? So that's a really good point. Talk about some silver lining to pandemic puppies and (laughs) and having a little bit more impulse control and, you know, being able to to observe and not have to interact with everything. Yeah. Well, what are... Go ahead. Sorry, I really like your suggestion of going on a picnic blanket or sitting on a table. Um, If you kind of have a place where you can go so that you've got a set place and then your puppy can see things, I think is really helpful for dog owners too, that they don't feel like they have to be moving towards things, but they can just stay in one place and kind of, they have a job to do in, you know, talking to their dog or training their dog or giving them treats, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, kind of lowering that expectation a little bit of I have to get in the mix. I have to throw my puppy in with that. Oftentimes, it's just that working around things or in the vicinity of things that can be beneficial. Are there any um, common mistakes that you see with puppy owners? I know we talked about like just kind of tossing them in the mix with other puppies or other dogs or other people too quickly. But anything that you see that's common in particular that really can um, cause some issues during that fear period? Um, so I think flooding is usually the biggest one. So really just kind of throwing puppies into an environment where there's so many stimuli and they really aren't able to, um, to cope with that. Uh, I've seen cases where, you know, something happens that's out of people's control. And that's a lot uh, of the times, you know, just something happens that scares the dog. And then they're seeing repercussions for that later on in life. But really, if you're noticing that your puppy is just showing some signs of fear where they didn't before, then it's possible they're coming into that period. And it's really just trying to set up the environment to be calmer. Maybe don't go 
to do as many new things, stick to things that your puppy is a little more confident in um, so that you don't risk that exposure. We, we see, you know, some, especially around the vet clinic, I think if puppies have a bad experience during that time, then going to the vet in the future can be really difficult and really hard on pet owners, which makes them not want to take their dog in. I know personally, when I was little, and I don't know that much about fear periods for humans, but I went to the dentist and had a horrible experience hearing my sister, who is younger, screaming in the back. And I am terrified of dentists now, even though irrationally, I mean, it's an irrational fear. I know that there's nothing wrong with the dentist. My dentist is lovely, but I have this association that developed when I was a young child and it's stick stuck with me now for 40 years. So um, I think, I mean, not that dogs are exactly the same as we are, but I think these fears that can develop just due to one incident can be like lifelong. So really just trying to be cautious, trying to be more aware of the environment that the puppy's in, especially during that time is really important. I really love that example you used at the dentist. I mean, I I hadn't even thought about it either, but I had a traumatic experience with getting an injection when I was a child. And I still, to this day, am like petrified of needles. You got to psych yourself (sighs) up, breathe a little bit. You're like, okay, it's going to be all right. Such an irrational fear, but it's kind of ingrained just because of something that happens earlier on. So that's exactly. So if we really think about that in terms of the experiences that young animals are having, I mean, trying to put it into that perspective, you can really start to think about what's going on and what might be affecting them. Absolutely. That's a great way to look at it and kind of empathize from their perspective. Yes. <laughs> well, and you mentioned too with the fear from veterinary hospitals and all of the clinics that I work with in the area, I encourage and they kind of uh, a little bit, but fun visits, like having puppies yes. come in routinely and not do anything, but just get a cookie, get a little bit of pet scratches from the girls up at the front desk or the guys in the back and just, you know, exploring one of the treatment rooms. And I understand that that's a little bit harder with COVID, you know, everybody's doing kind of curbside services, but I think it helps so much. I mean, I've seen it firsthand. We've seen studies on it to where if they're exposed, you know, and they have all of these positive exposures that they're not even bothered by the procedures and they're way more likely to offer cooperative care. And so I always stress this and maybe you can shed some light on this and some put some input with it. But um, really after that fourth round of vaccines, you know, when they get their rabies vaccine, you don't see them again until their annual visit. So that can be really scary if they're not coming in. And um, so now oftentimes what I'll do too is say, well, time it with heartworm preventive. You know, if you're, if you have a larger breed dog, they're going to have to come in and get weight. So bring them in, pop them on the scale, get a cookie and go about your way. Or just when you're on your way to the grocery store or the brewery with your dog, just stop by the vet, pop in and say hello. So what do you think about um, kind of scheduling fun visits and really trying to do things that will will um, help them have a very positive experience and kind of shy away from that um, owner fear of, well, I'm afraid to take my dog to the vet because I'm afraid that they're going to not like it and have a bad experience. Yeah. And I think, I mean, there's the prevention of that and then there's dealing with the actual fear. So I think if we can prevent that from happening in the first place, that's absolutely the best bet. Um, I also suggest that puppies go in frequently for, uh, to get weighed or just to get attention, to get cookies, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, right now, depending on what the practices are of your clinic, you may or may not be allowing that to happen. I know around where I am in Canada, some clinics still allow puppies to go in for cookie visits without their owner, as most of them are doing curbside visits. Um, but they will allow the puppy to go in get cookies, get some attention, but then you're not there with your dog to do that. Um, I typically recommend that during the socialization period and haven't been recommending it as much after that set of vaccines, but I think I'm going to now after this conversation because I think it's such a good point that they have the, all these experiences when they're young. And most of the time, every time they're going to the vet when they're young, they're getting vaccinated. They may be getting um, their temperature taken, things that might be scary for them. And then having that, you know, eight month period, six month period until they go again can definitely um, it can be fearful when they go in for that one year appointment. So I think it's very beneficial. I mean, if 
people could get on a schedule, even where the clinic could, if they had time, send a quick email and remind people to come in, you know, at a certain period in that time, if they just have it set up in their system, at like nine months of age, you come in for a quick weigh-in, um, if it doesn't correspond with heartworm season or anything like that. Um, Cause up here, typically heartworm season is shorter. So we aren't mm. giving our dogs medication all the time. It's usually like a six month period. I think in some of those more Southern states, it's year round. So you'd be going in more frequently potentially to weigh your dog. Um, but I think that's a great thing to do. And if it's not possible right now, trying to replicate at least some of that at home. So advising um, that people put their dogs up on something that might resemble a scale. Cause that's oftentimes I think one of the scary things because as a dog goes in, they tend to get weighed first. So they start to associate that weighing on the scale with all the other things that are happening at the vet clinic. So trying to replicate some of those things, if it's not possible to come in would be beneficial too. Yeah. I like using, you know, um, there's a company out there, I think it's like fit paw USA. They make all these fun, like, you know, physical fitness things for dogs to help with yeah. paw awareness and body awareness. And I, I often find like it's the noise or the unsteadiness that kind of sets the dog off with the scale. So, you know, typically I'll use like a place board and back them up onto it, maybe going up the stairs backwards, just, just different things like that to get them more comfortable. You know, the rolly carts at home Depot, when, you know, you put the yeah. dog on it and they kind of shift back and forth and make that noise. Uh, I feel that just doing different things with like that anyway uh, makes the scale a whole lot less scary. And if there's cookies at the other end of jumping on and then you get quick relief of coming off and then going back on and off again, it really kind of deteriorates that stress related to this kind of weird metallic, you know, noisy kind of object that you want them to, to place on. So that's a really Absolutely. good point. Yeah, and I like tying in the the heartworm preventive, and even if um you know you're in one of those northern areas where it's it's only you know partially through the year um, down here, there's no excuse. We're on heartworm preventive <laughs> year round because the mosquitoes are out here all the time. It's crazy, um, and it's so prevalent in the southeast heartworm diseases. So it's such a, a great opportunity. You know, most people like to buy their heartworm preventive you know six months or you know twelve months, but you could essentially just keep your your six month or 12 month supply at the vet. So you get your rebates and all that fun stuff. And then that can be your cookie treat coming in once a month. So you get your once a month visit, you get to pop on the scale, you get to say hello and boom, there's your, your heartworm preventive. So everybody's kind of on a consistent schedule. Yeah. I think suggesting that to clients would be really helpful and just really give dogs good, good experiences. Yeah. Making that part of your, okay. So, you know, here's your vaccine schedule. Here's how frequently we need to see your dog for annual visits. And when they're seniors, how often we need to see them. And by the way, here's what we need to do from a behavior perspective to help them not have stress in the vet hospital. Um, so I do want to ask you a little bit too about coddling fears because there's a difference. I, I think a pretty big difference between comforting a dog and providing security and re -encour or, or encouragement from the way that we pet and love and hold our dogs. But at the same time, there's that, that coddling piece that I always get concerned about. Can you talk a little bit about what, what that line looks like and, and how, um, if you think that over coddling can contribute to some of these fear issues that we see, I see this primarily in small dogs, but, um, I'm sure it happens in larger breeds too, but what's your take on that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that you can't reinforce fear itself. You can reinforce a lot of the behaviors that come along with fear, but not the actual emotion. So I th there was one study that was done um, where they looked at owner presence um, when a dog was on an exam table at the vet clinic. And they looked at a few other variables about the vet visit too, but they did find that there was improvements in heart rate and some other measures when the person was right there talking to their dog. So I, I think if possible, having owners around their dogs when they're coming in for a vet visit, um, obviously in non-pandemic times, is very beneficial. Um, right now, obviously, public health is <laughs> of utmost importance, so we have to kind of take that into account as well. But I, 
if owners are there and kind of just providing reassurance, they, I think giving owners a job when they are at the vet visit. So if you could hand them a bunch of cookies and they're responsible for giving the cookies or something like that. So they're still interacting with their dog. They're able to provide that support, but they may not be reinforcing um, things like whining or the dog jumping up on them and trying to escape that kind of thing. Um, I think things like that can be beneficial. Just trying not to reinforce those behaviors we may not want and might make that visit more difficult, but providing that comfort. That's perfect. And I, I love the idea of giving the owner a job because for the owners out there that are experiencing anxiety themselves about, you know, what's yeah. going to happen to their dog or their dog being upset about it, giving them something else to focus on, all of a sudden it becomes a lot harder to focus on your anxiety or your concern yes. or your stress about the visit in general. So that's perfect. Yes. Yeah, so you be the cookie dispenser. You give the love, you give the pets. Yeah. Um, well, and, and it is tough. I mean, obviously we're hoping, you know, things will kind of reopen and we'll get to see some normalcy, but what do you do in the meantime to lower their stress levels in the hospital without their, their owners? I've heard a couple people say, oh, well, you know, if it's something really simple, like just a, a Bordetella, a, an oral Bordetella vaccine, you know, we can go out to the car and just pop it orally. You know, that was one thing someone said. And then of course we have to be careful because of, you know, like aha regulations with, safety, you know, with, with leashing and dealing with cars coming in and out of the parking lot, that can be an issue of, of providing medical care outside of the clinic. But what are your thoughts there? Just some little ways that they can kind of help when the owners can't be there right now. Yeah, I think, um, I'm not sure what m most clinics are doing, but when I've had to take my animals to the clinic, it seems like a lot <laughs> during the pandemic. <laughs> um, and I've always spoken to a technician prior to it. Um, and I've been really careful to kind of give some information about my dog. So I have an Australian Shepherd. She can be a little unsure in situations sometimes. So I talk to them a little bit about that and, you know, what she likes. Um, people or vets can encourage clients to bring their own treats if there's say one that their dog has really or a really high value treat for their dog and have them send those in as well. So you've at least got that opportunity. But I think once the dog is um, in the clinic, just really taking things slow, trying to give them the opportunity to get used to the situation. I know everyone is really rushed right now, especially with all these pandemic puppies and kittens coming in. Um, the number of appointments that are going in and out of vet clinics is crazy right now. Um, so it's hard to slow down and really take your time, especially with fearful animals. But I think it's really important. Um, I find sometimes if you can just do something simple with a dog, say getting them to sit and you can give them a treat or something for that and giving them that kind of little tiny burst of confidence for having something like some kind of operant behavior that you can do with them can improve things sometimes too. So trying something like that, um, but also just getting information from the client about what works for their dog. So you can kind of have a plan ahead of time and be prepared to do what their dog likes um, and what they feel most comfortable. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, you know, in training and behavior, professionals in the behavior and training field, one of the first things that they look for, are what are the motivators for the dog? Do they really like food? Are they food driven? Do they like squeaky toys? You know, what are some things that this individual animal really enjoys? And then applying that um, inside of the clinic when the owner isn't there as well. I like that a lot. So yeah. thinking beyond the cookie a little bit too, you know, <laughs> yeah, for some yeah. dogs that are too nervous to take them or might really enjoy, you know, a tug toy or a squeaky instead, having the owner kind of bring that along. What do you think about bringing um, sibling pets along too, you know, for multiple dog households? Um, um, I mean, I think for some dogs that... I think it depends on the dog. I think for some dogs that might be really beneficial and probably the dog owner would have a better idea than the vet, than someone who doesn't see the dog very often if that can kind of help to support them. Um, but then some dogs do better on their own, I find too. So it's, I think that one's really dog dependent and it would be a discussion with the client about how their dog kind of manages on their own. Uh, I mean, right now, a lot of our dogs, if they're in multi-dogs households, are always with the other dogs. So they may feel more confident when another dog goes with them um, just because they're not getting that, you know, time alone most of the time anymore. <laughs> Yeah, you're used to always having that buddy, but you do bring up a good point. I mean, there's a, a, a chihuahua that I'm working with right now that 
um, actually does much better by himself because anytime he's with the, the housemate who's, you know, very high anxiety, very um, alertive, has has the startle bark and all that kind of going on. Yeah. So oftentimes that stress level goes up when around the housemate just because the housemate is is very unsettled a lot of the time. So that's a good point. You know, very individualistic when it comes to families as to how the yeah, other dogs I think are. We just- yeah, I think we want to be cautious though, because some dogs that are very fearful, they may seem like they're better when they're alone, but it's more because they're not, I mean, they're not to the extent of being shut down or anything like that, but they're just so fearful that they don't really show too many behaviors. So just to be cognizant of that and aware that just because a dog isn't acting overtly fearful, they may still be fearful. They're just not showing some of those overt signs. Gotcha. You think, I mean, kind of sliding into that freeze a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I was thinking too, is that, um, kind of, you know, with the fun visits, you just come in, you're not doing anything and maybe you walk around the clinic, but also, um, I know, especially with some behavior modification, we do a lot with movement, you know, kind of keeping the brain going while the body is going. So as you're coming Mm -hmm. in, instead of going right to the treatment table and right to the exam and right to the vaccines, or the blood draws, but walking around for a moment, getting used to the clinic, letting them smell and see a few things, and then kind of coming over to the treatment area. What do you think about that? Absolutely. I think that's a great suggestion. Um, and yes, that's what we use a lot of the time when we're working on behavior modification. So it's definitely something that would be beneficial in that situation too. And I mean, the sense of smell is so important to our dogs that giving them the opportunity to do that may help them um, feel a little more comfortable in the situation too. Yeah, the um, one uh, veterinary hospital that I work for, they have a lot of drawers in their treatment area and they'll keep um, some of the cloth muzzles below in the drawers, some of, some of the grooming items. So lots of smells on those things because, you know, multiple dogs are wearing the muzzles or with the grooming things and the, and the gloves, there's a lot of smells going on there too. So oftentimes what I've told them is just to open the drawers and kind of shuffle it around and let the dogs just take that in and kind of smell it and then close it and kind of move on to the next thing just to give them something to like look at and kind of distract and and kind of investigate and be curious about and really encourage that. I love that suggestion. That's such a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they seem to have fun with it. They're like, oh, what's this? And oh, what's this? You know, just so many different things to smell that we're like, okay, our stress level's coming down. This is good. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. So um, you've got some upcoming resources too that I kind of want to, I want to pick your brain on to see what you're going to be providing, but you're going to be um, offering some, some education basically for veterinarians, veterinary staff um, in regard to behavior science for helping puppies. And so I want to hear a bit about what that is and um, what kind of, um, what kind of help that's going to provide and what kind of education is going to be packed behind that so that people can benefit from that. So what are we looking at? Are you putting some courses out or? Um, it's going to be a membership community. So having Ah. monthly resources that provide, um, kind of the science on different topics related to behavior. I'm hoping to be able to get some experts in to talk as well, but really, um, talking about what the science, well, what evidence we do have or don't have for whatever the problem is or whatever the behavior may be. Um, so that, dog professionals really have something to fall back on and they, they're they more confident in the evidence that's out there. Um, also kind of keeping everyone up to date on some of the new science that's coming out and giving a bit more information on being able to evaluate the quality of the science that's coming out too. So almost putting a lot of research in kind of layman's terms, is that kind of what you're going for to make that a little yes. bit more digestible? Exactly. Yeah. And just kind of really, I think that especially in the veterinary field, there's so much information coming at veterinarians and veterinary staff about the medical side of things, but getting a bit more information about the behavioral side of things may really help their practice as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it really is a specialty. So unless you have a behavior tech or a behavior vet on board, it's often hard to get that information, especially current, modern, up-to-date information about the newest science that's out there. And again, in a digestible format that you can understand and relate to your staff. Yeah. And there's so much great work that's going on right now. I'm really excited about some of the science that's about to come out. So I think it'll be really interesting to take a look at that. Uh, Do we get a sneak preview? What do we have coming up? Oh, not my own personal stuff. But Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, unfortunately, I'm not doing research at the moment. Um, But there's a lot of work on um, just assessing behavior, reading behavior um, in cats and dogs, really getting better at that. And kind of, I think there's more work going on in kind of resolving behavior problems than prevention. But I'm really hoping that, you know, we can get some more of the prevention type 
research ruling so that we have more information about this type of stuff. Yeah. And, and to your point, that is tough because if you look at how that, that could be potentially done, it's involving, you know, one group of creatures getting what they need and what we feel they need to set them up for success and the other group, not necessarily. So I'm wondering if that, and this is, you know, my lack of knowledge in the research field, but if they're able to um, pull in animals that have already not had those socialization periods or had that critical exposure during those um, fear periods and socialization periods as a puppy, if they can use something that's already there to kind of um, be the opposite side to that instead of actually having to put animals through that to, to really nail down the answers to those questions. Yeah, absolutely. We can do a lot of retrospective studies where we kind of gather information about what happened. Um, the downside to that is kind of our human memory in terms of what happened during those periods or what exactly the dogs were exposed to. So um, trying to do it kind of close to the socialization period is really important just so that the information is a bit more accurate. Um, but there's definitely a whole range of socialization uh, experiences that puppies have. So I think that if we could get information from breeders, so what they're doing in that really early socialization period before these puppies are going off into homes and then also gather information about you know, what the owners are doing. So some of the research I did, we were um, getting people to fill out questionnaires at 20 weeks, of, when the puppy was 20 weeks of age or younger, depending on when they were enrolled into the study. Um, and we still found even, you know, with that short period of time that people didn't always remember, you know, how many people their dog interacted with or how many dogs their dog interacted with. So we're, when we're really trying to figure out, especially for socialization, you know, the numbers of experiences they should have, it's very difficult to do because our recollection of that isn't that fabulous unless we're really recording it carefully. And if you're recording it carefully, you may be more likely to be exposing your dog. So we may not get that lack of socialization. But then even when we did that research, we didn't have any information about anything prior to eight weeks of age or whenever they got the puppy into their home. So we've got the information from, you know, the home side of things, but not the breeder or wherever the puppy was prior to the owner getting them. And that's just as important as well. Uh, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think that you bring up something that sparks a good point, and that is um, preventive care when it comes to behavior. So from a veterinary perspective, really having a pulse on your, your client base and getting lots of content and information out there about what to do before you get a puppy, like let's set you up for success. You know, we give your animal vaccinations to prevent the disease. Now let's talk about what we can do to prevent some behavioral problems down the road by what happens before that eight week period. So you're out there, you're going to select a breeder or, you know, you've found a, you know, a, a rescue and they're having a litter of puppies. Like what are the important things to happen during that period before that eight, nine week mark where they leave mom or dad, or sometimes in rescue, even that six week mark, you know, what's happening prior. And then also kind of on the flip side of that, you're right. One of the things that I recommend is either journaling and or keeping a chart. I have an Excel sheet that I, I share with puppy owners and dog owners sometimes so that they can actually log it and see what kind of interactions that they're having. And oftentimes they're surprised thinking, retrospectively that they are having more experiences than they actually are. They're like, oh yeah, we go to the park all the time and we do this and we do that. And I'm like, okay, if we write it out, how many times are these things actually occurring? And it's like, oh, well, that only happened once in the past two weeks. And this only happened once in the past four days. And so logging that, <clears throat> having some sort of system where you can just jot things down or even a chart, like I said, like I, I use an Excel sheet, to, to mark those things can really help follow that pattern. And we can use that data throughout the dog's life to see. But I think from a veterinary perspective, really being proactive about helping people understand that they're going to need guidance and what to look for in those puppies and in those litters, especially from a socialization standpoint, um, prior to them even bringing that puppy home and being set up before that puppy even hits the door so we can prevent a lot of those issues. Yeah, I love your log idea. I think that's fabulous. And I think it would be really good. We need to get an app developer or something who yes. <laughs> involved in behavior so we can get them to design. That's we not are my currently favorite. working on that, actually. Oh, yeah. fabulous. Total side that's project. Great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's great. I would love to talk to you about that another time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I think 
I think recording that is really beneficial, both for the science, if we could ever analyze some of that, but also just for personal use and knowing kind of what our dogs are being exposed to. In terms of what to look for um, from a breeder or whoever is raising these younger puppies, um, I think just being aware of socialization is very important. So if the people raising the puppies are trying to expose them to other dogs, to other people. Again, right now, that's very difficult because that would typically, if it's a breeder, require people coming into your home, which may or may not be safe depending on where you are at the moment, um, but really trying to give them those experiences. Um, but what I recommend to dog owners, and it's something that you could do as a breeder or as someone raising really young puppies, is try, if you can't have other people coming in, try to look like other people. So put on things like Halloween costumes or, you know, different items of clothing. Um, anything you can do to really appear differently is important without scaring the dog, though. So you want to build that up gradually <laughs> and not um, make them fearful of that. Um, but also providing different environments for them to move through. So giving them different toys, giving them different things. It could be as simple as toilet paper rolls, you know, just different things to investigate, to walk over, to sniff, that sort of thing, um, and trying to change that up on a regular basis so that they're being exposed to new things. They're getting used to new environments, new smells, new um, things to walk on. And if you can have other dogs or other animals being involved in that as well, that's fabulous. Um, depending on where you live, if you can take the puppies outside, that's great too, because then they can experience a whole new world of things. Um, I know it depends on right now, we've got a lot of snow out here, so I don't think that's <laughs> happening too often. Um, but yeah, just really making sure that you can try to give them some of those socialization opportunities early. Yeah, that is such a great idea. I like Halloween costumes and things like that. I love that. Um, you know, I didn't even think about that because in the service dog world, we have like prop box days where we have, you know, we get the feather boa and the sombrero and we get the big old glasses and just try to switch it up and give them something that they might not necessarily see otherwise. Um, so I, I, I think that's such a great idea. Just anything you can think of, be really creative in exposing your dog to different things. Um, what do you think about like animal scents? You know, oftentimes I'll use those as enrichment in the, in the kind of in the field and you can purchase them with droppers and things like that. But if they're not getting out and able to be exposed to other animals, what do you think about that? Like putting something like that on their toys or letting them just kind of smell that. Do you think that really has any effect because the actual animal isn't there or what do you think? I think it still has a benefit. It's not the same, obviously, as the actual animal, but I mean, a lot of the times when we're trying to expose our puppies to things, you may just be breaking it down into bits and pieces of what the actual event or the actual object is. Um, so yeah, I think having sense available is a great idea. Um, and we use that with behavior modification too. You kind of, kind of, you know, try to expose them to just a little bit of something so that it's not overwhelming. And that's definitely a good option. I mean, if you're trying to expose puppies to say horses, an actual horse itself might be quite, you know, scary to a young puppy just because of their size. So if you can break that down, you can do the horse sounds. We often use like just regular sounds as desensitization for puppies too. So break it down to the sounds, the smells, um, and then even showing video. So there was this really neat study that was done and they were showing videos to young puppies and they found that they actually did watch the video and oh. they found differences as they aged in um, their fearfulness of things. So I think a lot of our adult dogs have learned that our TVs, I mean, for majority of dogs, our TVs don't really provide much value to them because nothing happens. So they've learned to mostly ignore it, except for the dogs that have this intense, you know, they bark or they try to chase the animals on the TV. We kind of get those two streams of them. But as young puppies, it's something new. So exposing them to even something like that. So if you don't have the opportunity to expose them to other animals, using sight, sound, vision, you know, all those different senses and different modalities could be really useful. That's a great idea. I love that. And I don't even think about the TV often either because so many adult dogs just do. They, they've learned to completely yeah. ignore it. There's nothing exciting about it. So yeah, yeah, good point, especially starting out with puppies. Yeah, they don't know yet that it doesn't provide value. Right, so. exactly. <laughs> so we can just yeah. roll with that. Well, and yeah. one of the... One of the, one of the um, 
one of the things that I feel a lot of puppies are, at least in my experience, and, and tell me if your experience differs, is, is exposure to kids, exposure to little kids. I find a lot of the adult dogs that I work with are like terrified of kids or they have a lot of predatory behaviors around them and have no interest in them otherwise kind of thing. So this can really be a tough period for exposing them to little people. So if there's no little people in the house, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts there? Kind of exposure from a distance at a park or, you know, what's the best way that you can kind of help them not um, be overly reactive or unfriendly with children later on? Yeah. I, I mean, I think <laughs> providing every option possible <laughs> um, and trying to do as many as possible is really beneficial. The problem with young children and puppies and dogs is that the different stages of child development are very different um, to dogs and to puppies. So right now I have a nine month old baby. So we're just getting into that crawling stage with our dog. Um, and her behavior as an infant was completely different than it is right now. So it's almost like two different people really in terms of their exposure. So if you can play sounds, so um, have sounds on low when puppies are young, when you're feeding them or something like that, of babies crying, of kids playing, of, you know, all the different noises you could think of. There's so many good, there's some apps available, there's YouTube videos, there's all kinds of opportunities to play different types of sounds. So getting those. Um, again, you could try the TV thing with the movement, that sort of thing. Um, you could try to, it seems silly, but you could try to behave as a child, you know, make some erratic movements, get them used to that sort of thing. Um, movement, you know, playing with them on the floor, that kind of thing. So they're getting used to that movement. A lot of the a lot of the problems I think that dogs have with kids is they're more unpredictable than adults are. So getting them used to a little bit of that unpredictability is probably going to be beneficial. Um, we don't have any research that I'm aware of that's really looked at that kid interaction very well. And I think it's something that would be very valuable to do. But if we can kind of see how we try to socialize puppies to other things, we can kind of extrapolate for that and really work on the kids side of things. But if you can go to a park um, and stay far back, so as we were discussing before, and really kind of stay out of the action, but allow them exposure to that. Or if you live even um, in an urban area and you can just sit on, you know, your stairs of your house and let them watch kids playing on the street or walking by, anything like that, where they can really observe that. I think that especially for kids, seeing things from a distance can be really beneficial to dogs because we want them to learn to stay calm around kids so that they're not getting overly excited and learning to jump on them and um, accidentally getting reinforced for that type of behavior, which is really easy to happen around children. So really teaching them we stay nice and calm around kids, I think is helpful. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Especially since they're so much smaller and, and, you know, accidents happen under that high arousal level and they're just right there at eye level and it makes things ooh, so much more concerning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like what you said about emulating kids' movements too, you know, doing that, the kind of the hesitation thing. I thought about that with our human education dogs and our therapy dogs, where we try to emulate the hesitation or the the unstable movements that perhaps an elder, elderly person would have, because, you know, some dogs might be concerned about that, that what seems like hesitant movement, but it's just kind of shakiness per se. Um, but to add on to that, I mean, I think about some of the things that dogs aren't used to that not only is kind of harmful in the veterinary perspective with cooperative care, like palpation, looking in the ears, the teeth, the mouth, the ears, the paws, but then also behaviors of children that don't understand boundaries with dogs. So it's often, you know, a situation where you know, a couple adopts a dog or purchases a dog. And then two years later, they have a baby. And so without some of those things set up ahead of time, emulating what kids do, the dog is probably going to be pretty thrown off and concerned when that baby starts doing some of those things like, you know, grabbing and pulling and pinching and manipulating, yeah. jumping on, palpating. And there's always only so much you can do as a parent to control that. Like things are going to happen. Kids are going to be kids. So as much as we try to parent and say, let's, have boundaries with the dog. We don't get on top of the dog's bed or on top of the dog. We don't pull and pinch. 
Um, I almost feel like it's very helpful to emulate some of that stuff, not just for the veterinary environment, so they're okay with with that, but then also for for future children that they're going to interact with. So touching those paws in between and letting lots of good things happen and looking in their ears and playing with their mouth and brushing their teeth and brushing and grooming and um, you, you know, just some certain just movements. Um, do you have anything kind of like to add on to that that you think would be good as far as from a palpation perspective to help set them up for kind of some unexpected things that kids might do to them later on down the road with that emulation. Yeah, no, and that's an excellent point and really important to um, get clients to start doing with their dog. Um, I think the biggest one with children is unfortunately tugging and yanking, which we don't <laughs> necessarily want to do. Um, but I mean, if you have a dog that isn't going to be too bothered by it, you could do kind of your regular, you know, fake exam and do palpation of them and possibly just pull slightly. I mean, very gently, but getting them used to kind of slightly more forceful handling, potentially. Um, you really want to be careful with that, though, because you don't want to have any fear involved with the handling procedure. I think the more that you can reinforce good handling and getting them used to that, you're just going, it's protective for the future. So if they accidentally do get, you know, a young child that grabs their fur and pulls it because they've had so many other positive experiences that are gentle, they're, I think, more likely just to be okay with that, get away from the situation, but it's not going to cause any damage or they may be less likely to react just because they've had so many positive experiences ahead of time. Right. Yeah. And I, uh, the other thing I think of too, is hugging, like kids love to, you know, hug and get yeah. in the face and we're always like, mm, don't do that. You know, let's give them their <laughs> space. And not everybody likes to be hugged, you know, same. I always try to explain to children too. And I think this is where vets in the room and, and techs in the room can explain it to little kids in a way that sometimes parents can is, you know, I'm a stranger. If I came up and hugged you without your permission, you might not feel very comfortable with that, or that might not make you feel good. So we want people that we know to hug us and kind of be in our space and, and understanding when the dog wants that and when they don't. Now, obviously that's older kids explaining that to them too, but do you yeah. feel that that's beneficial to where, you know, perhaps your dog isn't the most cuddly, lovey, huggy thing on the planet, you know, maybe our, some of our working breeds, things like that, but some of these working breeds are still family companions or family households. Yeah. So do you feel that there's a benefit to kind of increasing that, you know, in short spurts with some, some pressure or some holding and just lots of good things happening just to build up a bit of a tolerance, even if they don't seek it or want it necessarily? <laughs> Yeah, and no, oh, and I completely agree. I find that a lot of adults like to hug dogs too. It's not just yeah. the children. So you see that a lot. Um, but yeah, I think so. And I mean, that's also used as a method of restraint in some vet clinics too. Like you hug the dog to hold them in order for them to get vaccinated. Yeah. So I think exposure to that and making that a positive experience as much as possible when they're young is definitely a good suggestion too. Perfect. Um, so any other thoughts that you can um, lend as far as advice for, uh, for veterinarians, for, for even behavior professionals that are trying to help from a preventive measure with people that are bringing puppies into their families right now about really that prevention side of things, really laying down kind of a good foundation overall with their relationship with their puppy to prevent some of these behaviors that we are really more focused on than the prevention side of things? Yeah, one of the first things I do when I'm talking to new puppy owners is really discussing what their goals are for their dog. And I think mm. especially right now, that's really important. So trying to consider what you might want to do with your dog in the future. So if that is maybe your family might be adding children to the mix, or you want to be the type of person that goes out hiking or boating or, you know, all these different things, you want to be out riding horses, that sort of thing, really paying attention to what those goals are and trying to set up a socialization plan that involves those things or at least parts of those things. Um, so veterinarians um, can talk to their clients about what they would like to do with their dog, why they got that dog, then it can really help clients to start to think about what they need to expose their dog to. That is golden. Um, I love that goal setting. And I've, I've not even 
I've not actually ever heard that as a methodology with new puppies and new puppy visits. <clears throat> the only time I've ever actually heard that firsthand is with somebody that comes in with like a diabetic alert dog or a service dog. And you kind of already have this idea of what this dog is meant to be or meant to do. But for the everyday average family companion, that's fantastic. You know, I think about a puppy that I was working with in training, a little pit bull puppy, and their parents were... Um, uh, pretty avid um, gun range visitors and they wanted to be able to bring the dog out and have the dog comfortable and feel safe around the rifles for skeet shooting and things like that. And, you know, that's yeah. a, that's a process and you really can <laughs> either push it in one direction really poorly during, you know, fear periods where they're all of a sudden petrified of things like that. Or, yeah. you know, you can talk to them about their goals and kind of work them through that so that they can they can reach that goal together. So I love that you said that. That's such a golden nugget of information for people is right then and there, you know, what are your goals? If you, if you adopt, you know, he's, he's, you have an Australian shepherd, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So if you're, you're looking to, you know, like, Oh, I really want an Australian shepherd because they're so cute and they're so much fun and you're a total couch potato and you're not very active and you want a dog to just Netflix and chill, you know, it's good to know that up front because your veterinarian yes. might be able to say, mm. <laughs> either we need to pick a new dog for you or we might need to change your lifestyle up a little bit. So yeah. Yes. I, also that was such very important in choice of breed. <laughs> Yeah, that whole prevention, that's the overarching theme of this entire podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I think really talking about that makes people think about what they want to do. Um, and, you know, it gives them the opportunity to start that exposure during the socialization period, if at all possible. So I I, I hope more people can start to do that um, and really start considering that so that they are, you know, not thinking when the dog is four years old that suddenly they want to live on a boat. And, you know, I mean, obviously our lifestyles can change, but really trying to get the dog ready for that type of stuff early on, if at all possible, just can make everyone's lives are easier. Yeah. How does this dog really fit into my lifestyle and my daily activities? And, you know, how can I really make this dog a part of our family and our lifestyle? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Excellent. So, all right, just um, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that everybody can find you and continue learning from you because you have so much knowledge out there, especially on the puppy front which is fantastic. So um, for the membership series that's coming up and um, let us know, you know, what's the best way to kind of find you, reach out to you. Um, I am going to put, uh, people tend to ask questions in the YouTube comments and things like that. So if you want, feel free to keep an eye on those every once in a while in case they ask something sure. that would be better for you to answer as the expert than me. Um, but other than that, what's the best way to, to hear from you and to learn more from you this year? Yeah, so my Instagram is probably the best bet. So um, I'm at janetcutler.phd. And my business website is landmarkbehavior.com. So I post some information on there as well, but more, more consistent on Instagram. So it's probably <laughs> the best place to reach out to me. Perfect. Any conferences this year? Um, I... I'm hoping to attend some, um, but I'm not speaking at any. I have a nine month old baby at the moment. So I've been oh. trying to up here in Canada, we have a year long maternity leave typically. So I've been keeping things kind of low. Um, I'm teaching an undergrad course at the moment as well. So trying to keep my commitments to a minimum. <laughs> Good for you. I'll tell you what, just crossing that border. It's amazing. The difference in maternity care and <laughs> <laughs> So, well, thanks so much for everything. I really appreciate that. I'll put that website that you just mentioned in the show notes below so people can find you as well as a link to your Instagram page and uh, they can connect with you there. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was nice talking to you. You as well. We appreciate your input as always.